Samir has been involved in Islamic apologetics for the past six years and has taken part in public debates in both the UK and the US. He runs two websites, MuslimResponse.com and IloveMohammed.com, both of which have received hundreds of thousands of hits. Samir has launched Honor the Prophet Muhammad campaign in response to the Draw Muhammad Day, which thus far has received over 300,000 names on Facebook. The page can be found on Facebook by simply searching Honor the Prophet Muhammad campaign. Samir is currently a speaker for the Muslim Public Debate Platform, uh, the Muslim Debate Initiative. Now on to Jay. Jay is an expert in Islamic doctrine and culture. He is a gifted debater in Christian Muslim apologetics, which he's done for the past 15 years in London. Jay travels the world to take part in public debates on Christianity, the Bible, the Islam, and the Quran. You'll, you'll find Jay um, on a Sunday at Speaker's Corner um, uh, in Hyde Park, where he regularly debates these topics. He's widely acknowledged as one of the leading Christian authorities of early Islam and the Quran. So uh, tonight, basically, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to start off uh, with Jay. He's going to talk for 15 minutes on Jesus or Muhammad, who is more relevant today. Then we're going to pass it over to Sami. He's going to do the same. And um, then each speaker has then 10 minutes to reply, and another five minutes thereafter that. Um, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions, and there'll be final remarks. Um, to be clear on this, uh, what we're going to do is there are questions at the end, so please make no comments, uh, stand up, um, or say anything like that. Uh, we will not tolerate any uh, comments during that. We, will, we want it to be very clear that the speakers will be standing up and they've got their allotted time, um, so please do um, uh, adjust to that, um, and we will ask you to leave uh, if anything goes wrong. Um, yeah, no applause to the very end as well, thank you. Um, also, if you can turn off your mobile phones. Um, so if there's no distractions, that would be fantastic. Um, now let me invite Jason. It's great to be here tonight. I also want to, of course, this is the, not the first time Sammy and I have met. I think you can see Sammy and I are good friends. We've had a few debates already, and I'm sure we'll have many more in the future. Sammy uh, and I, unfortunately, both have American accents, which kind of gives away where I'm from. Though you will find that I'm not from America, though I have that accent. I've lived all my life overseas. Nonetheless, we both are passionate for what we believe. Uh, we're both passionate about who we believe in. I believe in Jesus Christ. Sammy believes in Muhammad as his model, his paradigm. And of course, then tonight we're going to talk of just about that. Who is the most relevant and which system, I would say, is, that they modeled or that they engendered is the most relevant. Day. Now, let me define terms. I assume that Sam is going to support everything he says in this Prophet Muhammad and also everything that he authorizes to say from the Quran itself. I'm going to support everything I say from the person of Jesus Christ. He's my model. But everything that I look to and everything I go to to find out about Jesus Christ is the Scriptures. Primarily the New Testament. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm representing. That's who I'm representing. And that's where I'm going to talk tonight. In doing that, we need to also understand that the model that we see about in the person of Jesus Christ, the whole idea of relevancy, is Jesus the most relevant, will probably not touch an awful lot of you, because Jesus did not do certain things. He was not a politician. He was not a, an economist. He did not participate in a family, in that he did not have his own family. So you might say, well, how can that be relevant? And how can he be relevant in those areas? Let me just venture to say that though he did not participate in a family, he did not have a wife and children, he, did not, he was not a politician like Muhammad was. What we can say about Jesus is that what the model that he used in every one of those are still being used today. And I want to focus in on that. I want to look at Jesus in his environment. And I want to look at seven areas that Jesus affected that affected all of humanity, that affected every society, and that affect all of us sitting in this room here. And the first area I want to talk about is humanity itself. Let's look and see what humanity was like when Jesus was living in the first century. It was a Greek and a Roman environment. In that environment, it was very strong. The Greek mentality, the Greek idea was that there was a hierarchy, a strong hierarchy of mankind. Homer, Aristotle, concentrated their views on the ruling class, realized there was low men who were to be in servitude and in slavery. Jesus, however, was not from high society. He was born in a stable, grew up as a carpenter. 
Eric Auerbach says this, Christ had not come as a hero, king, but as a human being of the lowest social station. His first disciples were fishermen and artisans. He moved in the everyday milieu of humble folk. He talked with publicans and fallen women, the poor, and the sick, and the children. And then while on the cross was hanged like a common criminal, flanked by two actual criminals, yet despite Christ's undistinguished origins, civil life, and lowly death, everything he did was imbued with the highest and deepest dignity. Still, instead of the Greek view, greatest shall be first, Christ says the last shall be first in Matthew 20, verse 16. And because of that, that changed institutions. So and so that Charles Taylor says Christianity gave us an affirm affirmation of ordinary life, which is the idea that ordinary people are fallible, and yet these fallible people matter. Thus society and the church is responsible for their ordinary needs. <coughs> Out of this whole ethos, then, came the idea of the nuclear family, the idea, idea of limited government that we're going to talk about a little later, Western law and relief from suffering, and we'll see how that impinges on all these areas as we go through this debate tonight. Let's talk about the family. Number two, when you look at the family in the first century, it was a family based on Greek and Roman viewpoints, the idea that uh, the man and woman had arranged marriages, women were unequal to men, incapable of being fr a friend of their husbands. The idea of love was one of eros and was based, the uh, highest form of love was one of homosexuality. Pederasty was used as a form of education in the first century. K.J. Dover says, pederasty was conceived of in terms of an exchange. The young boy agreed to sexual relations with an older man and in return he received knowledge and tutoring. Plato, Aristotle, they all wanted to even abolish the family as a function of the state, as a vehicle only for procreation. Yet Christianity brought in heterosexual monogamy, stood against homosexuality because of the teachings of Jesus Christ, stood against certainly pederasty, and then instituted the idea of a family as an institution that was a sacrament, civilizing lust so that marriage and childbirth was a calling from God, according to Martin Luther. In Genesis, 2, verse 24, Matthew 19, 5, 1 Timothy 3, 2, you have a strong call against polygamy for monogamy. So it comes straight out of the teachings of Jesus Christ and straight out of the Bible itself. Love for one's wife was endemic in the teachings of Jesus Christ. We see that in 1 Peter 3, 7, Colossians 3, 9, 19, where it says, Husbands must love your wives and never treat them harshly. The idea of equality between man and woman is imbued in Galatians 3, verse 28. All believers are created equal in the context, they are certainly equal in Christ. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, both can approach God directly. 1 Peter 3, 7, you are equal together in the grace of life. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 40, as is a beautiful image, when you look at it, of the whole relationship of a husband and a wife, where one's body was equal to the other. The idea of romantic love was actually introduced by Christianity. In first century, Greek society, falling in love was considered a mild form of insanity between a man and a woman. Yet Christ spoke about the husband and wife in many of his parables. He used that paradigm showing the whole family institution. Though he did not have his own family, he very much used it as a model of who he was with his father. Christians equated love between man and woman as between Christ and the church in Ephesians 5.25. And the concept of both woman and man was introduced at that time. A concept for a marriage relationship that was not just temporary, but was for life. That's why we wear wedding rings, to show that commitment. That's for life. Compassion. Let's look at the idea of compassion. Greeks and Romans did not believe in compassion. The idea of the stranger is not their problem, they would say. Aristotle was probably the best of the philosophers. Yet even when he used uh, compassion against a stranger, he only used it to show his superiority over those he was assisting. Christianity came in with the whole idea that compassion to the stranger is imbued even in our scriptures. Luke 10.33, the, the view of the Good Samaritan, Christ going to those who were despised and elevating them, is one of the greatest pictures we have of Jesus Christ. Suffering for others was endemic, not only in his life, but also in his death. And that's why Christians were the first ones to create hospitals <coughs> that was open to all. 
to start schools that were start usually as institutions that were for Bible study, creating arts, sciences, and humanities. Look at some of the greatest institutions today, Cambridge, Oxford, Yale, Harvard, Princeton, all of them were started as Bible schools, Christian institutions. Charities came out of this whole idea of compassion, and that's why some of the greatest names of the charities we have in the world today, Salvation Army, Red Cross, World Vision, Relief, YMCA, Kiwanis, Rotary, the name goes on and on. All of these were Christian, and some of them are still Christian institutions today. What about law? The whole idea of law was based on servitude. The Greeks had one law for the aristocracy and another for the workers. Christianity stipulated that aristocracy must be subject to a common law. One law for all. This idea of servant leadership was based on Christ's own example. Mark 10, 43. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Luke 22, 27. Who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who is at the table, but I am among you as one who serves. Therefore, leaders now judge by how well they respond to the concerns and the welfare of the people. Let's go on to the whole idea of politics. Probably one of the most contentious is one that Sammy and I have had a problem with over the past few years. And that is the idea that Christianity started and created this whole idea of separation of church and state. When Christ was asked there in, uh, in Matthew 22, verse 21, to look at a coin and say, who does the coin belong to and who should we pay taxes to? Christ said, whose image is on the coin? Caesar's image is on the coin. He says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God separating church and state. And that has been the model that has been used right down through the last 2,000 years. That's the model that we in the West still use today. That's the model that the church has always used. Therefore, the whole idea of separation of church and state gives the responsibility to the church different from that of the state. We don't impose ourselves on the state, although we are always there as a prophetic power within the state. Christ did not come to confront the state. He did not confront the Romans. He didn't even confront Herod when he arrested his cousin John. And when his disciples, the disciples of John, came to Jesus to ask him for help, look and see how Jesus responded to the disciples. He said, go back and tell John what I am doing. I am healing the sick, giving, sick to, giving sight to the blind, proving that he was not there to confront the state. No, he was there to confront the religious authorities. And his whole remit was one, of theology, of religion, of bringing people to God which is still the remit of the church today. Now, Simon is going to say an awful lot about how that that's not relevant for today. Actually, it's very relevant. Because you should never have a religious person in charge of the state, or in charge of politics, or in charge of economics. Let the politicians who are trained to do that be in charge of politics. Let them be voted into power. And even the whole view, the whole idea of polit politics, based on the democratic system, comes from 1 Peter. The priesthood of all believers. And yet we are to be under the state. Romans 13 is very clear on that point. And it's because of that that we in the West do not bring the church and state together. The church has a different reason. Islam brings the two together and that's where all the problems are created. Imams are not to be running politics. Priests and pastors should not be running politics. Let the economists run the economy. Let the churchmen and those in the mosque get people right with God. That's their remit, and that's what Christ came and showed. When you look at the whole economic structure, when let's look at that number six. How much time do I have left? Three minutes. When you look at the economy, and I'll probably skip the economy and go right to civilizing or the arts and sciences. When you look at arts and sciences, you look and see where Christianity, losing the example of Jesus Christ, looking and seeing what he allowed and the fact that there was permitted, they are permitted to have criticism. That's why we have criticism in arts, except tonight we haven't had much criticism at Trent University. Nonetheless, criticism was something that was endemic in the whole model that Jesus allowed, allowing those not only to critique him, allowing also music to exist. Monasteries that were started where the learning of the whole idea of learning and institutions began. Western art that came out of Christian art. Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, the Pieta, Da Vinci's Last Supper, Rembrandt's Christ at a Mass. The list can go on and on of the beautiful pieces of art that come out of Christianity because of that view of being creative, being made in God's image, therefore using that imageness of God in every area of life. Western music, Handel's Messiah, written right here in Britain. 
Mozart's Requiem, Bach's Water Music, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, these pieces of music that are endemic in Christianity and still exist today are part of that idea that we, following God and following his nature, can be creative as he was created. <coughs> Literature such as Dante, Milton, Shakespeare, Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and the list goes on. And science, just take a look at what Christianity has done for science. Look at the great scientists who are Christians. See if you recognize some of these names. Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Brahe, Descartes, Boyle, Newton, Leibniz, Gassendi, Pascal, Mersenne, Cuvier, Harvey, Dalton, Faraday, Herschel, Jule, Lyell, Lavoisier, Priestley, Kelvin, Ohm, Ampere, Steno, Pasteur, Maxwell, Plack, Mendel, and Lapmetra, even Einstein believed in a higher being, though he would not have called himself Christian. Fascinating when you just look at the names and what Christianity has given the world. Schools, hospitals, the whole idea of compassion. Look what he's given humanity. <coughs> Nuclear family limited government, Western law, relief of suffering. Look what he's given compassion to the world, the idea of including the stranger, taking care of the poor, the widows, the orphans, the hospitals and the orphanages that's come out of that institution based on the person of Jesus Christ. The whole idea of law as a servanthood that lawyers and everybody, the politicians, were to be subservient to those whom they serve. Separation of church and state. And I'll end with that. When you look at Christ, and you look and see what he started, when you look at the institutions that he initiated, and you see the outworkings of that in the world today, I would say, yes, indeed, Christ is the most relevant. Yes, indeed, that which he engendered, that which he modeled, that which he started, and the, all that which has come out of his example is by far the most relevant. Why? Because we are all standing here as people, people who have benefited from every one of those institutions. God bless Jesus Christ. I hope you accept him. <coughs> All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be debating Jay again for the fourth time. Hopefully we'll do this uh, many times more. Now, tonight's discussion, who is more relevant, uh, the Prophet Muhammad or Jesus? Now, I'm not going to say Muhammad's more relevant than Jesus or Jesus is more relevant than Muhammad because I believe in them both and I think they're both relevant to today's society. I don't want to say one's better than the other because I personally love and believe in both of them. I don't want to try to put one down and put the other one up. But nonetheless, it's very interesting. Over the last year, I gained my master's degree in Middle East politics. And so I can say somewhat now that I can understand the world in a better way. When you study politics, you understand how society works. You can analyze the problems that you see in society. And it's very interesting. In the year I was studying, the Arab Spring happens. And then you have all of these movements in the West, like Occupy Wall Street. And so you can see there's something happening in the world today. Many people are angry and frustrated. And why are they angry and frustrated? They want their social rights. They're angry with the economic situation, you know, economic imbalance. For instance, you have some people making hundreds of millions of dollars and other people aren't making anything. I've even worked in charity over the past year. And like every five seconds, a child is literally dying. And just calculate that by the end of tonight's debate. And so while you have these children dying, you have people buying private jets for themselves. And with the Arab Spring, people just want their freedom and dignity and so forth. And so when I look at the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, I apply his teachings and his relevance to this context. And what I see is that his teachings and his example have a great relevance to the modern problems we see. And one even just has to look at Muslims themselves. If you're a person who studies society, then you already know that the Prophet Muhammad is very relevant to the lives of the Muslims. So what about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? How can we relate him to what's going on to today? Well, 
we can look at the society he grew up in and the injustices people are against these days, such as the economic imbalance, the poverty, and so forth and so forth. So what did the Prophet Muhammad do about that? Now, you need to understand the Prophet society, the Arab pagans, the Meccans. These were people who looked down upon the poor people. They used to uh, take pride in how superior they were. You know, they, they took pride in being arrogant. In fact, what's very interesting is one of the main arguments that the, prof that the pagans threw against the prophet, just like past prophets, uh, the Pharisees did the same thing with Jesus, or the pagans did the same thing with Jesus. They would often say, look at these people, they're the poor. Only the weak people follow you. And you can even read this in early Christianity. The European pagans would often mock Christians, telling them only the weak join you. And then the Christians used to respond back, yes, to you they're the weak, but not really. You're the weak ones. So what you can see is that these religions, the Prophet Muhammad and Jesus, elevated the status of poor people. It got rid of this class war that you often hear about. You know, people often talk about racism, which I'll touch upon. But the biggest form of discrimination that we see today isn't based on your race, it's based on your class and social structure, where you stand in the social pyramid, whether you're rich, poor, middle class. So the Prophet Muhammad immediately removed that barrier. He would associate himself with the poor. He even said, let me rise with the poor people. The poor people will be the majority of paradise. And the Prophet even used to say that we should look after the poor people. We shouldn't look um, down upon them just because they're weak and poor. Rather, because of their situation, we should do more to help them and also be thankful for what we have rather than being arrogant. And this brought him a lot of criticism. And the Prophet even used to teach one of the best Muslims. This is what he taught the Muslims. The best among you are those who look after the weak and the poor, those who feed the people who come to you, even if you don't know them. And whenever the Prophet used to bump into homeless people or poor people, beggars, when they used to come to him, he would tell his companions, help them and give what you have. And the Prophet even went further. The Prophet told the Muslims to, he said the, the best charity is the charity given by the rich person. So he wanted to get those people at the upper class to give to the lower class, to get rid of this imbalance. And Islam also brought a charity system, an official institutional system called the zakat. And the zakat is basically a charity tax that Muslims give at the end of the year or when they're stopping fasting, 2.5% of their income for the poor people. So you have all of these teachings, and now put them in our modern context. These teachings are very relevant if you study society, especially in the Middle East. One of the main reasons there's a lot of anger in countries like Egypt and Libya and Tunis and so forth is because of the economic um, um, imbalance as well. You know, when the economy is bad, people rise up. And a lot of it is due to corruption. For instance, people in Egypt, they were below the poverty. Nobody was helping them. And so you apply the Prophet's teaching to these situations and it becomes very relevant. You know, there's a saying that's going on around, uh, a slogan, we are the 99% and so forth. Well, if you think of it, the Prophet Muhammad was also, and Jesus too, they were with the 99%. They would often associate with the weak and the poor. And they would often speak against the powerful for not doing enough or looking down upon the poor. So for me personally, this is very relevant. What about social reforms? As I said, people want their justice, dignity, and freedom. So what did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, do in regards to that? Well, anyone who studies the life of the Prophet will see that he brought major social reforms and social justice to his people. I already addressed the economic issues, but his people were a people who were also filled with tribalism, racism, problems we see in today's society. We still have tribalism and racism everywhere. I believe there was even a show last night on Channel 4 about it, um, Prejudice and Pride. 
You see racism and nationalism, tribalism everywhere. But what did the Prophet Muhammad do with that? He got rid of those social um, divisions. He said it doesn't matter if you're white or black, Arab, non-Arab, you're all the same. You shouldn't look down upon one another because you're of a different race. And even the Quran says that God made us different on purpose. We were made different so we could learn from each other rather than fight each other. Now you put that teaching in today's context and it's very relevant. Nobody can say that's not relevant to today's modern world. We see all these problems and we all know it's relevant. And what about freedom? Everybody wants freedom. So what did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, do when it came to freedom? We often hear about uh, Islam is against freedom and so forth and so forth. Anybody who reads the Qur'an, for instance in chapter 109, there's a verse in the Qur'an, a chapter in the Qur'an, which is all about religious freedom. You don't have to follow what I follow, I don't have to follow what you follow, and so forth. We go our separate ways and we agree to disagree. That is one of the basic foundations of Western society, and that's what most people want. You know, you don't have to follow me, I don't have to follow you. And you can also read the hadiths. For example, in the lifetime of the Prophet, the Prophet actually had a group of Christians, Christian scholars, about 60 of them, and they came to his own mosque. They came inside the mosque and they debated with the Prophet, like myself and Jay Smith are. And they told the Prophet, we believe Jesus is God, we believe He, cru he was crucified in a mosque. And not only did they do this, they stayed there for three days, and the Prophet even allowed them to pray in his mosque. So if there are Muslims who are causing trouble, who are against freedom, and there are, I'm not going to deny it, I studied Middle East politics after all, these people have gone off the path because they need to learn from the example of the Prophet. He invited people in his own mosque, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If he did, then who are you to get angry if someone disagrees with you or somebody who wants to debate with you? You know, if the Prophet is the best example, as they say, you go with his example. Christians in his mosque, he allowed them to pray, and then he even made a treaty with them that said, you will have your religious freedom and so forth. You know, you're not forced to convert to our faith. And even in Medina, when the Prophet went to Medina, which is a city in modern-day Saudi Arabia, or Hejaz, he made a constitution, because there was a lot of non-Muslims there, particularly Jewish tribes. And it's very interesting, in this document, uh, people often say Muslims hate the Jews, the Prophet was against the Jews, even though he's a Semite and they're cousins technically, he said that the Muslims and the Jews are one community. Imagine that. This, this is the Muslim Prophet saying, myself and the community, the Muslims are one with the Jews. Anyone who oppresses the Jew, they oppress us, we're one community. And that right there is also the modern foundation of modern society. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or whatever, if you're a citizen of this nation, anyone harms you, he harms everyone else. And that is very relevant to today's society, freedom. People want freedom and dignity. And the same with Jesus as well. If you read the teachings of Jesus, he never forced anyone to convert to his faith. He used to preach to them. He even used to get oppressed. He never forced anyone to follow him. And that was his way. He even used to tell the people, if nobody accepts you in their house, then just wipe your feet and walk away. The same teachings from both men. So for me personally, when you put the... I could talk about many other things, but these are the main aspects that are relevant. Freedom, social justice, dignity, and getting rid of the economic imbalance. And when you look at what the Prophet achieved in 23 years, I mean, even with women, this was a society that used to bury their daughters alive. They used to kill their female daughters. In fact, there was a Muslim who converted to Islam during the days of the Prophet, and he was telling the Prophet how he buried his daughter alive, and while he was burying her, she was cleaning the dust off his beard, and the Prophet started crying at this. And that, it's a very graphic description. And the Prophet got rid of that teaching. The Prophet condemned it. The Quran condemns it. 
The Prophet came up with many new rules for women. They could choose who they want to marry because the pagans used to have a system where if you got uh, divorced or if your husband died, you could, she would be married off to anyone else within the family, like some piece of meat who didn't matter. And the Prophet got rid of that. The Prophet <coughs> gave women a right to an inheritance. All of these rights were made official. I mean, it's just a century ago that we talked about women's rights in America, the country uh, myself and Jay Smith were born in. And he wasn't, I was. And we're talking about the women's rights, but these rights were brought 1400 years ago by the Prophet Muhammad. And there were many other teachings which are also relevant today. I mean, for today we have a lot of problems with sex trafficking, unfortunately. And in the Quran, it specifically says 1400 years ago, don't force women into prostitution. Don't do this to them. Because even the people back then would do it. And so, you put that in a modern context, it is very relevant to today's teachings, no matter what some secular atheist would say. These teachings are very relevant. And over a billion Muslims find relevance in these teachings. And you can't ignore that. If there are over 1.5 or 6 billion Muslims who look to the Prophet as an example, then it's just a fact that they are relevant, these teachings in the Muslim society. Muslims look to the Prophet as an example. They look at his life and how they can improve themselves and their bad conditions. And that's what many Muslims are trying to do. So obviously we discuss more. But yes, the Prophet didn't simply teach these teachings. He made them institutional to have a role in government. And as someone who studied politics, I can tell you that it's, it's irrelevant and it's not really that strong for you to just talk about teachings but not putting them into practice. You need to put these teachings into institutions. Now, you shouldn't force people to follow your religion, but there's nothing wrong with a person putting these morals into the institution as official codified law instead of just having them as some nice principles because we can have nice principles but it doesn't mean people are going to follow them just look at modern day society people go with what they want so it's very important that you do get involved in society and you do make these changes through the political system because that's the only way you can change the system and it's true that Jesus didn't go into government he was first trying to reform the people before you can start making institutions. You need to fix yourself first before you want to fix everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Sammy. That was very good. And I think in some ways, Sammy and I agree on certain things. We do agree on the person of Jesus Christ. Don't think we agree necessarily on the person of Muhammad. And I think uh, one of the things we need to ask, and one of the things I did at the very beginning of the debate was to define terms. In order to talk about Muhammad, we need to go to his revelation. And to understand him, we need to know what he has given us. And uh, Therefore, I'm going to ask some questions of Sami, and I hope you do answer them, uh, concerning some of the things you've just said, since this is a rebuttal. First thing, <coughs> you talked about Muhammad as part, being part of the poor. Part of the 99%, which is the phrase that the, um, the uh, Occupy Wall Street is using. Part of the poor 99%. And then he elevated the status of poor. Are you aware of the fact that he also received one-fifth of all the booty in his raids, according to the Maghazi documents written by Ibn, uh, Ibn Waqidi? I have Ibn Waqidi in the bag here. You can look it up. One-fifth of everything that the Muslims raided went to Muhammad. Was he really part of the 1%? And I would ask you, was he not really the part of the very problem if he received this much? When you look and you ask that he was, that there was a charity system based on zakat, and zakat is one of the five pillars, zakat is two and a half percent. What about those who were not Muslims? What about the Jews and Christians who lived under Islamic law, who had to pay kharaj tax and jizya tax that the Muslims did not have to pay? Look at the kharaj tax, which is a tax for all land that was owned, and jizya tax, which was a tax on all that they, they earned. When you look at that tax, it was as high as 15 to 20 percent. Much higher than 2.5 percent. Is that just? And is that relevant for today? 
Do we have one tax for the Muslims and another tax for the others? You talked about social reforms. And you talked about that you got rid of tribalism, got rid of racism. When I look at this book here, there's lots of reference here that really, that really disturb me. Let me just read one to you. Surah 5, Ayah 51. O you who believe, take not the Jews and Christians as awliya, which means friends or protectors. They are but awliya of each other. And if any amongst you takes them as friends, then surely he is one of them. Verily, Allah guides not those who are the zalimun, that means the polytheists. When you look and see what Muhammad did to the Jews in Medina especially, I don't see that this is a good model, a relevant model for today. We know that when he moved there in 622, he was not a, a citizen of Medina. He had come from Mecca. The Jews were citizens. They had been there much longer. They controlled the economy. Yet within two years of his movement to Medina, he then turned on them. We know after the Battle of Badr in 624. When you look at Ibn Hisham, you look at the Silapud, Silapura uh, Rasulullah, when you look at the, the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, written by Ibn Hisham in 833, when you look and see what he was saying and what he did to the Jews there, the Baal of Aluka family, who were the first Jewish tribes that he turned on, the Baal of Aluka family, which is the second tribes that he turned on in 625, a year later, throwing out both those tribes, throwing them out of Medina, yet he was not himself a citizen of Medina. He had been invited there by the Ansar. And then two years later, in 627, the Banu the largest remaining Jewish tribes of the three major tribes there, after 20 days of confronting them because they did not support him when he fought against the Meccans, he then took all 800 men and slit their throats one afternoon. Now, this may be hard to listen to for many Muslims, but this is sourced in Ibn Hisham, you can see it in al waqidi you can see it in Al-Buhari, and you can see it in al tabari I've given you four different sources in three different genres, in both the Sira, also in the Hadith, and also in the Tafsir. Now, let me ask you, is that a model for today? Is that relevant for today? Now, you may say yes, but they reneged on the Treaty of Medina, which you go on to. And look at the Treaty of Medina, and first of all, remember that the Treaty of Medina, the only thing we know about the Treaty of Medina is from Muslim sources. I would like to see what the Jewish would have said about the Treaty of Medina. I would like to see whether they actually accepted the Treaty of Medina. Because the first article of the Treaty of Medina is that Muhammad would be an arbiter between man and God. What Jew would sign a treaty like that? I would sign a treaty like that. So how can you say that they reneged on a treaty when the treaty was set up with a bias towards Islam and certainly a bias towards Muhammad? Remember, he wasn't a citizen of Medina. The Jews were. When they reneged against them, and you might say, yes, that they betrayed that treaty. I'm sure if I were in his place, their place, I would betray that treaty as well. Not only because what they had already done to the other two Jewish tribes, what he had already done to the Banu Kanuka, the Banu Nadi, and I'm sure the Banu Kudayz and Nur is just a little bit of time before they would be thrown out as well. Now let me ask you, let's put that into 20th century environment or 21st century environment. Let's just say, as an American living here in Britain, there may be 50,000 of us living in London, quite a few Americans. Let's say a number of us decide to try to blow apart it. Remember, how many people, according to... <coughs> According to Ibn Hisham, how many people amongst the Banu Qurayza actually fought and betrayed Muhammad? Look at the list. Only seven. Only seven are named by Ibn Hisham. Seven went and joined the Meccans at the Battle of the Trenches. So why then did he slit the throats of 800 men? If you're going to put that in today's environment in London, a few, let's say 720 Americans go and try to blow up Parliament. They're caught. Should all, Amer should all Americans in London have their throats slit? Using that as a paradigm? Using that as a model? Do we do that in the 21st century? Is there any other culture in the world that has that kind of model? And if that is the model we see in the Prophet's own example, is that relevant for today? And I say, absolutely not. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say when he was betrayed? Look and see how Jesus was betrayed. Even by his own disciples he was betrayed. They ran away from him when he was going to be arrested. When one of them tried to defend him, 
and cut off the ear of the servant. What did Jesus say to that servant? He put the ear back on the servant, turned towards Peter and says, Peter, put away your sword. For he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. That's my Jesus. Ooh, I love Jesus. See, he makes all the sense to me. And see, that's the model we're asking for today. We're asking you people, look and see who's the most relevant model. Jesus. Whipped. Scorned. Had a crown of thorns put on his head. Put him on the cross. And look and see how he responds. He looks at those who have crucified him. And he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What a man for today. Talk about relevancy. Ooh, I love Jesus. He makes so much sense for me. And he's the man all of you can know. And see, we're not talking about a model that's 1,400 years ago. We're talking about a person that lived 2,000 years ago. And yet he's still as relevant today as the day he died at the cross. So be careful when we look at relevancy and ask, which is the man you want to follow? Who is the man that makes more sense? You say Muhammad gave freedom to follow other religions. And the only reference you can come to is Surah 109, verse 6. That's really the only reference. You could probably have gone to Surah 2, 256, which is there is no compulsion in religion. The problem is, just look at the other myriad of verses you could have gone to that actually contradict that. Contradict both of them. All from the Medinan surahs, which are much more authoritative, because they were written after Surah uh, 109. You could have gone to Surah 9, Ayah 29, which is the last, the last surah revealed to the Prophet the year he died in 632, which says, make war on the people of the book. That's us. Ali Kitab. The Christians and Jews, you're to make war upon us. Until what? Until we pay the zakat. Surah 8, Ayah 39. Slay the unbelievers. Surah 47, Ayah 4. Slay, cut off the throats of the unbelievers. These are heinous verses that your prophet was revealed. If that is his example, is that relevant for today? Do we slay One minute left. the unbelievers? You said that marriage and divorce... Muhammad gave rights of marriage and divorce to the women. Did he really? He gave rights of marriage and divorce to the man. Surah 4, Ayah 3 says that he, a man can have up to four wives, but that's not reciprocated for women. There's already an imbalance, inequality built into marriage. And then as far as divorce is concerned, look at Surah 2, Ayah 229 to 2.30. Just look and see what it says about divorce. A man can divorce his wife at any time just by saying, Alec, three times. Does a woman have the same recourse? No, she has to go to arbitration. Proving that even in divorce, she is unequal. Is that really relevant for today? Thank God for Jesus. There is no difference between man or woman. Slave or free. Jew or Greek. All are equal in Jesus Christ. We are to treat our wives as Christ treated the church. And as Christ was willing to die for the church, so we must be willing to die for our wives. That's relevant for me. I give you Jesus. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Now, most of the points I said in my presentation stood. But what we're seeing now is why he did all these bad things. I want everyone to remember all the points I made still stand. You can read them for yourself. Now, just about the, I'm going to try to get through everything, but it's very interesting. He says, I quoted a verse about religious freedom. Um, why didn't I quote to uh, chapter 2, verse 256? And um, he said that in Medina, the peaceful verses or the verses of religious freedom were abrogated or removed. But that verse from Surah 2 was revealed in Medina. So I don't know from where he got that argument. Now, secondly, as for the issue of divorce, since, since this is fresh in your mind, there are many cases when women would go to the prophet and would ask for a divorce, and the prophet would grant it. The woman would ask for the divorce. As for the man simply saying, talaq, 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 yes, he can do that, but... The Quran doesn't command them to do that. Divorce is something that Islam does not recommend. So if a man just divorces his wife for no reason, for the sake of it, he will have to answer one day to God because you can't play games just for the sake of it and divorce a lady. 
And secondly, we need to be consistent now because uh, what about the Bible? You know, I don't really care, but you need to be consistent here. And what does the Bible have to say about divorce? In a Bible, a lady cannot even get divorced unless the husband commits adultery. So if she abuses you, beats you, whatever, you can't get a divorce. So I mean, we need to be consistent here. I mean, sorry, you can't just use that argument against me. And in the Bible, a lady can't even get divorced no matter what. And if she does get a divorce, and we know many Christians do get divorces, some of the highest rates, unfortunately, in the West, but not because of Christianity, mainly because of the social structure. According to Jesus, if you get divorced, you are an adulterer if you get married again, according to the Bible. So, I mean, how's that for divorce? And what about um, one-fifth of the booty? It's true, the prophet used to take one-fifth of what they would capture in war, but there's a reason for that. He wouldn't take it for himself and become rich. He would take it and give to the people. For instance, once the prophet came back from Bahrain, it wasn't called, I, I'm not sure if it was called that back then, but he came back with so much goods, and he put it in the mosque, and he let everyone take it. He didn't take a single piece for himself. In fact, there was a man who was so greedy, he was taking so much, it kept falling, and the, he asked the prophet to help him. And the prophet just looked at, looked at him, saying how greedy you are, but the prophet didn't stop him. So the prophet would give all of this to the people. And let's not forget that many of these people lost their possessions when they were kicked out of Mecca. They lost their businesses. In fact, the pagans, imagine you were forced out of your home, and then the people who forced you out of your home sold your possessions. How would you feel about that? And they started taking your trade routes. How would you feel about that? I, I don't think any of you would be happy about that. And there's nothing wrong in retaliating against them. We retaliate all the time in Western society. I mean, look at the Nazis. We practically firebombed most of Germany, turned it into rubble. Look what happened in Japan. When we, and you want to compare that with the prophet, we retaliate, yes. War is not always bad, but there are limits to what you should do in war. And the prophet didn't go and kill everybody. For instance, the Beni Khoreza, the prophet did not kill everybody. The people who were killed were adults, and yes, that sounds bad, but it was a former Jew. This is, the, this is what's very interesting. It was a former Jew who judged them because they wanted him to judge them. The Bani Pureza tribe, which J. Smith admits betrayed the treaty, they asked for a Jew, and if once you're a Jew, you're always a Jew, according to some. It's not just a religion. You can be an atheist Jew. So they asked for this Jew to judge them, and he judged them by Deuteronomy chapter 21. Read it yourselves. When you conquer a town, kill all the men, leave the women and children. So this, he judged them by their own law. So if you find that bad, then you should be against your own Bible, not against what they did. And secondly, yes, it might sound a bit bad, but it was war, and they betrayed the treaty. And they didn't just betray the treaty. You know what happened? They betrayed the treaty by trying to kill and wipe out the Muslim community. The Muslims were surrounded from the north and the south. So the Muslims dug a trench around Medina. Now behind the Muslims was a mountain, so the pagans couldn't come from there. But who was on that side? It was the Beni Qurayza. So the Muslims eventually were surrounded. And what happened was that a sandstorm happened. And the Beni Qurayza eventually didn't want to join with the pagans after they found that the pagans weren't doing so well. The Bani Qurayza basically told the pagans, they managed to send a few people, they told them, we'll attack the Muslims after you attack them. And it never happened. So that's why what happened, happened. They tried to practically wipe out the entire Muslim community, and they failed. And secondly, again, they were judged by their own law. So you can't, you can't really attack Muslims when that's coming straight from the Bible. Now what about the jizya? The jizya, first of all, is very cheap. And there are many hadiths from the companions themselves who said the jizya should be cheap, it should not be excessive, and it shouldn't cause you trouble. So if the jizya is actually hurting you, then it's not the example that the prophet and the companion gave, companions gave. 
So that's irrelevant to me. Secondly, not everybody had to pay the jizya. If you were a woman, if you were young, if you were old, if you were religious, if you were a priest, a rabbi, you wouldn't need to pay it. Even if you're handicapped, even if you were rich and handicapped, you wouldn't need to pay it. And also people who would enlist in the military would not have to pay it. Secondly, what is a tax? A tax is something you pay for for a service. So the service was there to look after the non-Muslims. Nothing comes for free. The Muslims had to pay their part. Non-Muslims have to pay their part. We pay taxes in the society to get looked after. Similarly, they pay those taxes to get looked after by the state. In fact, when Muslims could not look after them, Muslims had to give the money back. When does that even happen in today's society? And yes, we do have taxes in the society in the West based on discrimination. In America, for example, the rich pay a lower rate than the people below them, while in Europe, people with more pay more than those below them. So that's not even grounding if you want to be really technical. But most people don't complain unless you're in America. So that point isn't really much. As for not being friends with the non-believers, in chapter 60 of the Quran, verses 8 to 9, it tells Muslims to be kind and good with non-Muslims who are not bad to you. That to me sounds friendly. As for the verses he brought up, it says don't be awliya um, or awliya with the non-Muslims. And that's not the word that's used for friend in Arabic. People don't call someone uh, my awliya or my wali as my friend. You usually say as sadiqa or even as the companions were called sahaba. Why doesn't it say don't take them as friends, sadiq or sahabas? It says awliya, which means allies as protectors. And even that comes with conditions. You, should, you can take uh, non-Muslims as allies in certain conditions. This verse was referring to non-Muslims who were at war with the Muslims. But if there's non-Muslims who you have common interests with, who are not at war against you, who don't really have a problem with you, who have no back agenda against you, then some scholars say you can make alliances with them. And the Prophet did it himself. And that's a topic that needs two hours itself. So you can't simply quote this verse and then use a whole theology around it. There's a lot of explanations. And if you want to be technical, in the New Testament, it says, don't be friends with non-believers as well. What does righteousness have to do with unrighteousness? And it equates unbelievers with the devil, Belial, however you say his name. It's in the New Testament. And the New Testament even says, if someone disagrees with your beliefs, don't even invite him to your house and don't wish him Godspeed. You know, so we need to be consistent. Now I'm sure he'll have some responses, but we can both play the same game. If, but obviously people don't want to be consistent. And I think that was most of his points. Last point, if Muslims oppressed and were against freedom, then why do Christian communities still remain in the Muslim world today? The oldest Christian communities the oldest churches are still standing in the Muslim world. So you don't have to believe me. They are living proof that Muslims are tolerant. Because if we weren't tolerant, there wouldn't be a single Christian living in the Middle East. In fact, the second largest Jewish population in the Middle East is, guess where? Iran. Thank you. Christians are not permitted to divorce except on the crisis of adultery. To me, that's something that I that I see as a real plus. It shows the high view of marriage that we have in Christianity. I am very proud of the fact that I have this ring on my finger, and this ring is for life. It doesn't matter what happens. I do not divorce my wife, except in case of infidelity. Now, that doesn't mean I can beat her. Like it says in Surah 4, Ayah 34, in your book, you can beat your wife. We are not permitted to do that. It's very clear that we're not permitted to do that, because that we see... In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, we are to love our wives and our bodies are to be one and the same. That doesn't mean that I can dishonor her. No. In fact, we have Matthew 18 as a very good corrective as what we are to do whenever there is a problem between a husband and wife. And we can go on and on. But talk about divorce. Let's look at Surah 2, Ayah 230. Because there, in your own Quran, your prophet's revelation, it says that a man, if he divorces his wife and then decides to take her back, she must marry another man, and he must divorce before she, he can have her back. Now, where is that just for the woman? 
And what does that say about the rights of the woman? Thank God we don't have verses like that in our New Testament. Thank God we don't have that kind of revelation. You say that war is needed. And when it was war that the Meccans, I'm sorry, that the Jews were foisting upon Muhammad. I, you really do need to read the story in both Ibn Hisham and also in this book here. Uh, Ibn Hisham, I'm sorry, uh, al -Wakini. Look at the story again. It was not the Jews that were attacking the Medinans. It was the Meccans that were attacking the Medinans. Be careful there. The trenches, yes, the battle of the trenches was against the Meccans. And according to Ibn Ishaq and according to Ibn Ishaq, there were only seven Jews that were involved in that. Read the story again. This idea that they were slaughtering them, they were coming to overwhelm them. The fact that there was a trench there, it was a stalemate battle. There was no battle in 627. So why, again, I ask, why should all of the Jews, the remaining Jews, the Bani Qurayza, be eradicated because of the guilt of seven? That is not relevant for today, and that's what we're talking about. You said that the Jew that was that gave the order was a Jew, and as you as you concerned that he was always a Jew. Actually, he was a convert to Islam, a very clear convert. You said they used the Old Testament, the Bible. Does that mean that Muhammad is therefore scot free? Therefore, that Muhammad had no recourse? Does that mean that Muhammad should use any law from any land? And is that just? And is do we do that in Britain today? Thank God we don't. You said that Surah 60, I have, well, let me just go on to something else. I think I'm going to run out of time. You say that the Bible says that don't be friends with non-believers. My goodness, what verse are you talking about? Show me one verse in the Gospel of Jesus Christ where it says we are to not be friends with non-believers. There's a whole litany of verses. Just look at the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemaker. Blessed are the strangers within your midst. Take care of the orphans and the widows. Love your enemies. Show me a verse like that in the Quran. Show me one verse that says love your enemies. Mm -hmm. Love other Muslims, yes, but not love your enemies. That is unique to the preaching of Jesus Christ. What a man for today. Talk about relevancy. And then you say that the oldest Christian communities are in Muslim lands. Folks, they are the oldest because that's where Christianity started. Exactly. And what happened to the church in those lands? Look what happened to the church in North Africa. It was decimated by Umar and those who came after Muhammad using his example. There is no church left in North Africa. Take a look and see. Where are the churches that used to be there? And you say that they are the thriving? They are not thriving. Just look at Iraq today. Within three years, there, there probably will be no more Christians left in Iraq. They're fleeing Egypt. And they're going to be fleeing by the hundreds of thousands because you say the Arab Spring. I call it the Arab Winter because of what's going to happen. Nevertheless, that's not what we're arguing today. We're arguing, look at Jesus versus Muhammad. And I leave Jesus for you. What a legacy. What a man. There are churches there, and there are even synagogues there. I mean, that, I don't even, that's like me saying there's no mosques in North America. Just visit uh, North America. I have Christian friends there. So that point is mute. Now, yeah, it's true, Christianity started in the Middle East, but if Muslims are not tolerant, they shouldn't even be there anymore. So that point remains. Now, secondly, ask for, show me a verse where the Quran or Islam says, love your enemies. There is no verse that says, love your enemies, but there's something that says something better in chapter 4, verse 135. And for me, this is stronger. This says, show justice to people who you hate. Now, that to me is far more effective than saying, love somebody. Show justice to, to somebody who you hate. You know, when you hate somebody, but still be just to them. That's almost saying the same thing, but in a stronger manner. So that, for me, is more effective. And secondly, that verse was officially institutionalized. It's not just a teaching that you can choose to follow with no relevance. And I'm astonished, I'm truly astonished that Jay Smith says 
There's no compulsion in Islam, but if you don't believe in Allah, you go to hell. Really, a Christian wants to bring up hell. I mean, should I even bother responding to that? Haven't you read the book of Revelations, the lake of fire? Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Matthew chapter 8, verse 12. Matthew chapter 25, verse 30. Matthew chapter 21, verse 41. 25, 41. The Bible teaches you will go to hell if you don't believe in Christ or the lake of fire with sulfur and so forth. So I'm not sure from where he's coming from. But at least we established the fact that I quoted the verse from Medina. Again, my point stands. And again, if the Muslims were not tolerant, look at the Middle East yourself. And it's true. Christians in Iraq are being oppressed. But who brought that instability to the region? I study Middle East politics again. When America came in, all hell broke loose, basically. And not only Christians are dying in Iraq. Sunnis are dying in Iraq. Shias are dying in Iraq. Everybody's getting killed there because of the instability that America caused. And that's a fact. So we don't even go there. And everyone acknowledges that. I mean, I don't want to talk politics, but when America went into Iraq, you know what they did? They got rid of all the police forces, all the army. So when you get rid of the army and police, what do you think is going to happen? Look what happened in London in the summer riots with minimum police. Now imagine an entire country with no law and rule. What's going to happen? So America should be responsible for those Christians who are suffering in the Middle East, in Iraq specifically, because they were not suffering before they came in. In fact, Saddam Hussein's right-hand man, Tariq Aziz, I believe, he was a Christian. So that point is also quite mute. As for wife beating, before we address wife beating, again, I need to be consistent. In the book of Proverbs, it teaches Christians that you can beat your child with a rod. In fact, there was a case of a Christian parent who beat their child to death. So we need to be consistent. Now, as for the wife beating in the Quran, the word is daraba. Now, that word does not literally have to mean beating her hard. It can mean a light strike. Now, some people might say, oh, Muslims made this up. Well, that's the exact explanation that the Prophet Muhammad gave. And that's the e exact explanation that Ibn Abbas gave. Ibn <coughs> Abbas was related to the Prophet. And he explained that it's, it is a light tap. It is not to beat her and cause bruises or hurt her and so forth and so forth. And that's what our Prophet teaches. Now, if you don't accept that, then that's not my problem. That's your problem because you, you just want to be stubborn. If that's what the very man says, that the beating should not be hard, should be light, that causes no pain or leaves no marks. And as we know, women are very tender. It's very easy for them to bruise. And he's saying, don't cause them to be bruised. It's light. So you obviously know it doesn't really cause pain. But even after this, if you want to insist that it's really causing pain, then it has nothing to do with me or the Prophet Muhammad. And as for the Bani Quraiza, yes, the Bani Quraiza didn't attack the Muslims. Read the story. I told you why. Because they were waiting for the pagans to attack them. But the pagans, as he said, were in a stalemate because, thank God, the Muslims built a trench and they couldn't come in. And so the, the Bani Quraiza were just waiting and then they were going to attack. The Bani Quraysa were not stupid to go into war alone, which they knew they would lose. And again, they were judged by the Bible, Deuteronomy <coughs> chapter 21. Cool, thanks very much guys. Um, we're going to have a five or ten minute break now, um, where there will be sheets of paper going around, and pens as well, where you can write down questions, and then we'll bring them up to the front, separate them out, um, and then I'll explain a bit more at the next session how that's going to work. So thanks very much. We'll start off with Jay first, and um, we'll take off from here. Uh, what's going to happen is Jay's going to have three minutes to talk on uh, the question he's been given. Sammy's then going to be given a minute to reply to the same question. Um, yeah, cool. That's, that's good. Let's run up. The violin verses, is that? Violence in Jesus and violence in, with Muhammad, I guess it's the Bible verses in the Bible and the Bible verses in Christ. Okay, 
Violent verses in the, in the Bible, let's start with that and then we'll go to violent verses in the Bible. Uh, in, if you look at violence in the Bible, you will see that the Old Testament does have violent verses, very violent verses. And then they go to peaceful verses in the New Testament. So it goes from violence to peace. And many Muslims have asked me, well, is not God the same God of both Testaments? Is not God the same of both the New and the Old Testament? Therefore, is not God the God of violence and of peace? It seems like he contradicts himself. And the answer to that is very clear, and that is the whole idea of what, how, what we call progressive revelation. What Moses was given in the Old Testament in 1400 B.C., we leave in 1400 B.C. We don't follow that paradigm today. One of the things that we were going to do in this debate, we are going to compare Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. And we probably threw out Moses because it really was not relevant to either Sammy or me. Moses is not relevant to me. I don't follow Mosaic Law. I don't follow the Deuteronomy Code or the Levitical Code. I follow Jesus. I hope that's very clear tonight. So I leave what is in the Old Testament in 1400 B.C., knowing that God was doing something that was unique then, and realizing that Jesus fulfills all that. And he says, I have come to fulfill the law. All those laws, therefore, do not uh, 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 pertain to me. So the violence that is there, I no longer permitted to use as a Christian for the kingdom of God. Violence still exists today in the world, yes. The state does go to war. And we allow the state to go to war. But the church does not go to war because Jesus does not allow us to go to war. That's the difference. That's what needs to be understood. So the violence we see in the New Testament, show them where it is. Where is the violence? Luke 19.27 is the only place you're going to find any, and that is a parable about the last days. At the very end of time, God's going to come with his host, but not the church. The church is not going to participate in that violence. That is going to be for God and his hopes, and that's the last judgment. So we need to be prepared for that. And I ask all of you, are you prepared for the last judgment? And that's why it's so important that we look and ask, where is this violence? Jesus says, put away the sword. Bless them the peacemakers. If they slap you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. We are not to use violence as a church. Thank God. I'll let Sammy talk about the violence in the Quran. I'll let him deal with verses like Surah 9, 5. Slay the unbeliever wherever you find him. Surah 47, I have 4. Cut off the heads of the unbelievers. Surah, oh, there's so many. In fact, there's about 149 violent verses, all in the Medinan surahs, which is the most authoritative part of the Quran because of the law of abrogation. Built into the cross. Surah 2, Ayah 106. Surah 16, Ayah 101. Both stipulate if we have two contradictory verses, you always go with the, the later verse. You always go with the beginning surahs. You always go with those verses. And that's where the violence is. So in the Quran, it goes from peace to violence. In the Bible, it goes from violence to peace. What is it? we want today? We want peace. If you want peace, you've got to come back to Jesus. If you want peace, you've got to come back. All right. And, um, thanks for that. So I'm a bit confused. So if you go from violence to peace, that's a good thing. But peace to violence is a bad thing. So are you against violence or not? It doesn't sound like you are. It depends on the sequence. And secondly, I disagree about not following the Mosaic Law. For the past two nights, I've been debating a Seventh-day Adventist in Brighton and Portsmouth. And they still follow the law. They keep the Sabbath and they still eat kosher meals and so forth and so forth so they keep the law but now I agree with Jay I'm not going to try to refute him and say oh no you have to follow the violence of the Bible but I will use his standard against him Jay admits that Jesus will come back and kill and commit lots of violence just read Luke 27 and read the book of Revelations but Jay has a problem with the Quran when it says people will go to hell so therefore, you can't be against God's judgment, but then when God shows His judgment in the Bible, it's supposedly a good thing. So you have to be consistent. Jesus will come back and commit massive amounts of violence. Thank you. We're going to go on to our next question now. What about the inequality of women in the Quran? Ooh, okay, uh, which talks about the Trinity. Let me help you out. Let me just look at seven verses in two different surahs. Write them down, women. This is for you especially. And ask, what does the Quran say uh, concerning the exegesis of these two verses? Let's start with four, uh, Surah 4, Ayah 3, which says that a man has got four wives. And I already introduced this earlier in the debate. Is that equal? Does that allow women to have up to four husbands? Call polyandry. No, not at all. A few verses ver later in verse 11, it says that a woman has half the inheritance of a man. Is that relevant for today? Do we allow women to have half the inheritance today? No, we don't. 
A few verses later in verse 24, 04, 8, 24, it says, A man can have as many as his right hand possesseth, as anybody knows that exegetes that verse, that means as many women that are caught as slaves of war. Above and beyond the four wives, we would know them as concubines. Is that relevant for today? The idea of slavery, the idea of having a say, uh, slaves of war, uh, prisoners of war, is not relevant to say above and beyond the four wives. And then, of course, you have so far Ayah 34 that he does not like and says it's beating lightly. That's interesting. Take a look and see what it says at the beginning of that verse. For men are protectors of women, but to those women who do not, who stand against their husband, admonish them first. That's the first thing you do. Not your right, don't do it again. Secondly, throw them from your bed. That's pretty serious for a woman. Because her whole identity is born up in childbirth and taking care of her husband. If you throw her from the bed, that's pretty well taken away her identity. And then it says, if that doesn't work, then beat her. It does not say lightly in the Arabic. is the word it uses. That's the root of drubbing that we use in English. Dada means to scourge. There's no lightly. They put that in the English translation because to be politically correct, they've got to put that in there. And that was only introduced in 1935. Surah 2, Ayah 282 says that a woman has half the testimony in court. Why should a woman have half the testimony in court? Is that relevant for today? And then Surah 2, Ayah 223, was probably one of the hardest verses for me to understand. It says that a wife is nothing more than a tilt for her husband, that a man may plow his wife anytime he wants. Oh, horrendous when you stop and think of the implications of that verse. And then Surah 2, Ayah 230, that I talked about earlier, where it says that a man can divorce his wife, but if after he divorces her and wants to take her back, she must go and marry another man, and then that man must, get, must divorce her first before he can take her back. Which shows me the women have no right going over their own body. Not according to these verses in the Quran. And it's these verses that we need to look at. We don't have verses like that in the Bible. In the New Testament, just the opposite. Look at the testimony, the greatest event in the whole history of mankind. Christ rising from the dead. Who did Jesus show himself to? Not to any of the disciples, not to any men, to a woman, one woman, who in the first century environment of Judaism had had the testimony of man, yet Jesus chose to show the greatest event in the whole history of mankind to that woman. And the second time, we'll have to wait for that for another time. Back to Jesus. All right. Um, is having four wives practical today? Yes, it is. When you look at uh, men with all their girlfriends and uh, harlots on the side and cheating on their wives, I mean, what are you talking about? I'm a young man and I know what happens with most other young men and the people above my age. So yes, having four wives is very practical. Or no, you don't need to have four wives, but you can have a wife and a girlfriend on the side, but that makes it all right. And by the way, when you're somebody's girlfriend for five years and he ditches you, he has no right to her. But when she's his wife, he, had, he now has a right, she has rights once she gets divorced. So that actually gives the woman rights. In fact, the irony is that they want to give girlfriends rights now, like they would do to the wife. And that's quite funny. That, why don't you just make her your wife? Varava does not mean scourge, it means hit. And it doesn't have to mean hit hard, uh, hitting her hard. Men have double inheritance, yes, because they use half of that inheritance to take care of the family, while the, mo while the woman's inheritance is all for herself. <coughs> Thanks, Harry. Um, now, next question. Um, what is Sharia law, and do you agree with it? All right. Um, Sharia law is basically um, the law of uh, the Islamic God or the law of the true God. And Muslims would even say uh, Moses brought uh, Sharia. It simply means the law of God, the Mosaic law. We would call that Sharia. So it's basically the rules and the, what, God's want, what God wants you to implement. And of course I agree with it. Um, you can't disagree with what God says, now can you? Not only do I agree with it, um, Jesus agrees with it too. He said, you must teach the law and you must follow the law. Now you might think it's a different law. Actually it is because the law he was talking about is far more strict than the Sharia of Islam. So Jesus even taught that you have to follow the law. Practically most prophets in the Bible follow a law. But now let me make it clear. I don't think we can force Sharia on you. So while I agree with it, 
I don't think we have a right, or I have a right, to force it onto you or to force it onto any non-Muslim country. In fact, I'm against those people who say we need to now set up Islamic Emirates within the Western world. I'm against that, and in fact, that is against Sharia law. You can't go into a non-Muslim country and just say we're not going to respect your laws and do whatever we feel like. You can't do that, and so I'm against that, so let's not uh, twist it. So yes, I agree with it, but I don't think you should be forced to follow it. So I believe in freedom, and now you have your right to disagree with it. But again, with Jesus, again, he had his law. He taught his people to follow a law, and he had his sharia. And I mean, Jesus even condemned his own people for not killing their children, because we know it's part of the Mosaic law, to kill bad children. He was, um, he was having an argument with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were attacking his disciples because they didn't wash their hands before they eat. And the Pharisees had their tradition, you need to wash your hands before you eat. It's like a law now, although it's not in the Bible. So Jesus told them, you claim to care about the law, so why don't you kill your bad children as the law commands you to. And expose their hypocrisy and I can see someone shaking their head I'll bring the verse for you Sharia law do we think it's just do we think it's relevant tonight we're talking about relevance let's look and see how relevant it would be for a Christian for myself living under Sharia law if it were brought to bear today my life would be inferior it'd be a capital offense to murder a Muslim but not so if a Muslim murders a Christian according to Abu Dawood and Buhari Less worth. The blood rate for a kafir is half of that of a Muslim, according to Maliki's al risala 7498. Less honor. It would be a capital offense for a Christian to rape a Muslim woman, but not vice versa, according to Maliki's al risala 7520. Less integrity. The Christian testimony would be inferior to that of Muslims due to dishonesty and unreliability, according to the Hanafi manual, al Hidayah, Volume 2. Less reciprocity. New churches would not be permitted to be built, only repairs given, according to the Hanafi manual, al Hidayah. Less equality, deities or protected persons, that includes myself and Jews, would be not permitted government posts, according to Maldudis, many of the Quran. Discrimination, jizya tax for punishment that would be leveled with, leveled with humiliation, according to al Hadaya, volume two. Above criticism, cursing Muhammad would be a capital offense, as we see in the C-295 law, and we find that in Maliki's al -Bisan. Is that relevant? Um, now, next question. How can you quote the Bible when there are so many differentiations between them? Ah, this is an interesting one. <clears throat> differentiations in what? And I think this is something that's good for Muslims to ask us because I think this is a common misconception that Muslims have concerning our Bible. There are many translations of the Bible. There are many versions. That means many translations of English language. True. But they all go back to the Greek manuscripts. All of them. So we have the NIV, we have the NASB, we have the NEV, <coughs> and there are many, many others. These are not different Bibles. These are not different corruptions of the Bible. They're the same, they're the same basic text, just said in a different way. You have the same thing in the Quran. I can take you right now to five different Qurans in the English language. Yusufali's Quran, Fikdal's Quran, Arbery's Quran, Ayyad Ali Khan's Quran, and it goes on and on. There's about 125 different Qurans in the English language alone. And what's more, when you look at them, they don't even have the same versification. To say nothing of the way the verses are translated. But what's interesting is the Bible goes way beyond just English translations. We have over 2,500 translations of the New Testament today in modern languages. There's no other book like the Bible that's been translated. They all go back to the Greek text. And that's why they are trustworthy. And I would encourage all you Muslims, in whatever language you come from, and I hope you come from many different languages, come back to the Bible, because this is really the Word of God for you today. It's a lot more relevant, and it also makes a lot more sense, because it talks about one man and one man alone. And that's Jesus Christ. All the way from the Old Testament, it points to it, showing the Messiah who is yet to come, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the God who would be one with us, God who would be Emmanuel, God with us. And that's why we don't change the Bible. That's a misnomer. We don't change the Bible.
There are 40 verses that are in doubt that Sabi's talking about. Yes, we know those 40 verses. We even put lines above and below them. But they have the same problem with the Quran. We know of lots of manuscript variants in the Quran. Look at the newest polypsis that are now being brought to light. Look and see those polypsis and look how we're finding Qurans with verses underneath and more top and with ultraviolet light, we're able to now separate them and we can see the two different texts of the Quran. Most of Muslims have never even heard of this before because you don't have this kind of criticism within Islam. Quranic criticism doesn't exist. That is unique to the Bible. We don't corrupt our Bible. What we do is we make it more intelligible so that you can understand it in your own language. In many different ways of speaking, as you can with English, as you can say even now, we have two different ways of saying the same thing. Same language, no corruption. Come on. All right. Um, it's not just different translations. There are different Bibles. For instance, the Gospel of Matthew, for example. Many people often don't know this, but the earliest reference we have to the Gospel of Matthew is a gospel written in Hebrew, and it just has a bunch of sayings. That's not the gospel we have today. In fact, one of my friends has a Bible, and even in the introduction to the Gospel of Matthew, it says that the earliest reference to the Gospel of Matthew was a Hebrew Bible, Hebrew Gospel language, with just a bunch of sayings. Obviously, that is a different gospel, not just a translation or a different version. Secondly, the reason why many Bibles have different translations is not because they simply have a difference uh, of using a language. It's because they're using different manuscripts that disagree with each other. And I, yeah, I recommend all of you to buy the academic books on this topic and you will see this for yourself. Thanks, Sammy. Okay. Um, you mentioned that the Quran is about freedom. Does that mean that if a Muslim living in the Middle Eastern culture wanted to convert to Christianity, would he be able to? <coughs> All right. So, um, good question. The issue of apostasy. Now, I've addressed this issue before. Now, I'm not shy to admit it. There are some Muslims who say that the apostates should be killed. But um, when they say that, I need to clarify it for them. They only say that it can be done in an Islamic state with an actual Islamic leader and a judge and so forth. So somebody can't just take the law into their own hands. It's up to the uh, leader, the caliphate. But secondly, my opinion is that if you just decide to leave the faith, that you don't have to be killed. And I have lots of evidences on my side. For instance, I look at the context of the ruling when it said those who leave the religion must be killed. Now, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to base an entire issue of ruling based on a small text, but I'm going to put it with the entire context. Now, during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace, uh, peace be upon him, apostates back then weren't just uh, like today a bunch of just a man who lost his faith and wants to go to another faith. Back then, apostates would leave the religion and then they would go with the pagans and they would start fighting against the Muslims. In other cases, apostates would actually pretend to be Muslims. They would actually literally be spies. And you can find these in the tafsirs, the interpretations of Ibn Kathir, one of the greatest interpreters of the Quran. You can find this in the hadiths where people came to the Muslims, pretended they were Muslims, but they were in fact spies. And this is always the context we, uh, we find. There is a verse that even talks about killing apostates in the Qur'an. Fight the renegades. It even calls them renegades because they were Muslims. Then they left the faith and they started fighting the Muslims. So I believe there is a very specific context to the issue of apostasy. So I don't take that opinion. So that would be my response to that issue. But now what I would ask for is for consistency because the Bible has rulings on apostasy. Deuteronomy chapter 13 says you should kill apostates. In fact, the Bible goes further. In the book of Chronicles, it says that anyone who does not seek the God of Israel should be put to death. Now, that's even taking it more extreme than apostasy. Even if you don't want this God, you should be killed. Now show me any verse in the Quran or the Hadiths which say, if you don't believe in Allah, you will be put to death, like the book of Chronicles. That verse 
doesn't exist. And Jesus never condemned those laws. He said you must follow those laws and teach those laws to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus backed apostasy laws of the Bible. So you need to be consistent if you want to attack Islam. I don't think we're attacking Islam. I think we're asking relevant questions. And these are questions that ask whether or not this is relevant for today. Apostasy is in all four schools of law, in the Hanafi, the Maliki, the Shafi, and the Hanbali school. All four schools have a law of apostasy. So this is not something that's irrelevant. It's also found in Ahadiah, the Hanafi manual, Ahadiah, chapter 9, verse, volume 2. Uh, there is a verse in the Quran that seems to support it, and this may be the foundation for it. In Surah 4, Ayah 89, let me just read it. They wish that you reject faith as they have rejected faith, and thus that you all become equal like one another. Take not the protectors, that's Aluya, or friends for them from them, till they emigrate in the way of Allah back to Muhammad. But if they turn back from Islam, take hold of them and kill them wherever ye find them, and take neither Aliyah, protectors, nor help us from them. Now, there, there are many exegetes who have exegeted that verse. My God, Islamic Shahi, Suyuti. When you read their exegesis, look and see how they exegete that verse and ask whether or not they consider that apostasy or not. We'll leave it there. That's a huge subject, maybe for another debate. Um, if government should not take laws from religion, then why do we in court swear on the Bible? So that's if in government should not take laws from religion, then why do we swear on the Bible? I don't think we should swear on the Bible to tell the truth, so I'm one of those that actually stands against that. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure that's my question. That's a question for me. It's relevant to me or today. Maybe get another question. I think Sam and I would agree on that. One thing we do agree on. <laughs> um, explain the Bible, says Jesus. said, don't take me as your Lord. Why do you worship him? So, okay, explain. The Bible says, Jesus said, don't take me as your Lord. Why do you worship him? Uh, is there a source for that? Anybody know the source for that? I think he just said over and over again, he did take, and he did take worship. Uh, he certainly took on the divine names. And certainly over and over again, we see Jesus uh, claiming to be God. There's this question that I hear from Muslims all the time. Where did Jesus say, I am God? Now, I don't recall that Jesus spoke English, nor did he say, I am God, in English. But he would have used the language that they would have understood in that time, in the first century. He, would have, he was talking mainly, primarily, to a Jewish environment. So he used Jewish terms. And in Judaism, there were divine terms that only God could employ. Four of them we know that he took. In fact, I, would, I ask you to go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 62 to 66. It's probably one of the best places where Jesus says, I am God, very clearly. Caiaphas, the chief priest comes and confronts him there in front of the Sanhedrin, and he says to Jesus, are you the Messiah, are you the Son of God? Important that you look at those two titles. Messiah, every Jew knew, was the anointed one. Muslims don't understand this because in the Quran, Jesus is called, or Issa is called, al-Masih, the Messiah. But for them, that only means a human. But in the Bible, it's very clear that the Messiah is the anointed one, the anointed to save. The function of a savior is only God himself. Only God can save. They were waiting for the Messiah to do just that. The Son of God was he who's not a biological Son of God, and that's a huge confusion in the Quran in Surah 5, Ayah 72, Surah 4, Ayah 171, Surah 6, Ayah 101. We don't have time to get into that, but when you look and see, those confusions in the Quran are not confused in the Bible. And Caiaphas asked this for a reason because he knew that if he was the Son of God, he inherits everything the Father inherits, which means he was God. And that's why he asked him, are you really God? And how did Jesus respond? Yes, I am. He took those two titles, but he didn't stop there. He then went on and said, then you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, referring back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, which is another divine title. In fact, take a look at that title. The Son of Man. The title that Jesus took more than any other 25 times, he took that title for himself. And look and see what the definition is for the Son of Man. Not a Son of Man, as you are, and you are daughters of men, uh, but we are. there is only one who is called the Son of Man who is from everlasting to everlasting, have dominion over all tribes, nations, peoples, and tongues. Folks, that's about as much of a divine claim as you can get. Who is from everlasting to everlasting but God himself? So when Jesus took on that title, along with Son of God and Messiah, look at the reaction of Caiaphas. He tore his robe, turned towards the Sanhedrin, and said, what further proof do we need? This man has blasphemy. And that is why Jesus was crucified. Because he dared to take on God's divine name. 
John 8, verse 58, it's probably even more clear, where they come to him, the Jews come and says, how do you know Abraham? And he says, before Abraham was Yahweh, I am. Remember, that's God's holy name. Jesus was taken on God's holy name. Right? Yeah, it's true. Jesus spoke Hebrew, not Greek. And so, why do you read the Greek Bible? And secondly, read the Hebrew. The terms Son of God and Messiah in the Jewish language do not mean God. That's a fact. <coughs> secondly, even if the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus for blasphemy, this is a question Christians never ask themselves. Uh, the Pharisees weren't in charge of Jerusalem. The Romans were. So why in the world would the Roman care about some Jew calling himself God. That's like the state of Britain getting in, uh, involved in a sectarian fight. They don't care about such issues. That's a question nobody ever asks. Why would the Romans get involved in a Jewish interfaith conflict? They could care less about whether Jesus thought he was God or committing blasphemy. That was not the place of the Romans. So why would a Roman kill Jesus for blasphemy when they're pagans? Why would the Romans kill Jesus for committing supposed blasphemy against the Jewish faith? Pilate was not a Jew. So. Okay, I've been told we're going to actually take a, a question from the floor now to Sammy. Um, can I emphasize this is not a statement, this is not, you're not preaching now, you're not doing anything. This is a question. So if you could please be as concise as possible. Sammy, can you take one? Can you want? If my question to you is, if a woman was elected president in a Islamic country today, what would Muhammad have to say about it, and what verses in the Quran can you use to back that up? All right. Um, before, uh, what's very interesting is that they did a study and they found that in Muslim countries, there's a higher representation and percentage of Muslim females in parliaments than some Western countries. In fact, Afghanistan has a higher rate of females in government than the American Congress, my own government. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was specific that a lady cannot be the head of the state. Now, she could probably be a scholar, a teacher, in those levels, it doesn't matter. But when it came to the head of a country, say like uh, President Bush, that high, yes, in Islam, uh, the Prophet said that those fields are not for women for specific reasons and it's because of how Islam has a look an outlook on women for Islam it sees the role of the woman to take care of the family because as we all know even studies have been made about the strong institutions of a family even Jay Smith uh, referenced it to it how the family is important and many societies have shown that without a strong family that most of those people end up as criminals and get into a lot of trouble. So Islam places a very heavy emphasis on the family, on the mother taking care of the child and raising him or her. And so the way Islam sees it is that if a lady is the head of a country, this will take away from her responsibility from her family. Now people disagree with that. But that is how Islam views the issue. And what's very interesting is that many other traditional people in the West used to believe the same thing, that the role of woman is to look out for the family, to raise the family, which is the most important aspect of society. You need a good mother to raise you because you're built from your house. If you have a strong house, you have a strong foundation. If you don't have a strong house, you don't have a strong foundation. Just watch any documentaries on these young kids on the streets. They're gangsters. That's what they call themselves, street gangsters. Most of these thieves, robbers, drug dealers, they find uh, a clique with each other. They become their own small community because they feel like a family. Why is that? Because they have nobody in their homes to turn to, and so they have to turn to the streets. And these are basic soci uh, society studies. So that's why Islam places that heavy emphasis. But nonetheless, women can still have roles in leadership. For instance, Aisha, the Prophet's wife, led a group of Muslims, a group of Muslims, an army. She led an entire Muslim army. So women can be leaders, but just not the top leaders. Thank you.
Yeah, I think that as Sammy has answered your question very well, and that is there are cases, and take a look at the two cases that most Muslims will go to as female, uh, uh, female power. Khadija, the first wife of Muhammad, and Aisha. Notice they're both wives of Muhammad who are given this. Find any others outside of those two, and you'll be hard put. Now, does that mean that there are Muslim states today don't have women leaders? No, they do today, and I agree with Sammy. In fact, they do a very good job, which seems to suggest that they are not following the Prophet's example. Again, possibly because of the influence of the West on them. Possibly because of the examples of the role models that they see in the West, because women do and are given equality. They are supposed to give them equality by the law. Is that, does that always happen? No, it doesn't always happen. In every society, including the West, there is injustice for women. Nonetheless, it's the, the basis that women are equal that you find only in the New Testament. And that's why I love to come back to verses like Gen uh, Galatians 3, 28. Or I like to come back to other verses like what you see in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 to 40. Or if you look at Ephesians 5, 25, there is the equality that we're looking for that we don't see in the Quranic verses. Okay, we're going to take one more question now for Jay. Uh, you only have two minutes, I'm afraid, uh, to answer it with. If you could. Okay, go ahead, sir. Do you have them here? Good luck trying to find it. It's a question. It's just a question. These are words uh, of Jesus Christ about a daughter woman, and she was even woman. Woman, her name was Jezebel. In which uh, book of Revelation, Jesus said, I will strike her children dead. Some Christian scholars try to justify it by saying that it means followers of illegitimate children. Actual, but I have tried to look the actual Hebrew word, it says the real uh, blood child. As a Muslim, I would say that it is the fabrication of Saint John, who himself was a gay and adulterer. How would you justify killing of innocent children by the words of Jesus Christ? Wow, that's a, quite a statement you read there. Uh, I, first of all, I would not, I don't believe that John was either gay and certain, I'm not an adulterer, because that would be a contradiction in terms right there. Nonetheless, let's just look and see what John does say. John is very clear uh, that in Revelation that women are given equality. You can see that not only because, take a look and see who, took, who John took care of, and that was the mother of Jesus. And look and see the freedoms that he gave her. And that, that responsibility that was there. I don't see anywhere that there's a scripture, and I'm not sure the one you're referring to, where it says that we are to kill innocent children. I'd love to know where that comes from Jesus' teaching. In fact, he says just the opposite. Take care of the widow and the orphans. Very clearly that he's telling us to take care not only of children, but he also uses many of his parables as a child. And we are to be like children. So where in the world would Jesus ever say that we are to kill children? I do know that there is the... Luke 19, verse 27, that Sammy brought up earlier, uh, that is at the end of time that there will be a tribulation. Okay. Now, as far as, the, as far as the revelation is concerned, that is something that's going to happen by the heavenly host, but it's not something that Jesus said to do. Book of Revelation. Sorry, Revelation. sorry, you can't. You can't. <coughs> Come with me afterwards, we can talk about it and see what that, whether that is, because there's an awful lot of allegory in Revelation that an awful lot of people, even Christians, have a hard time understanding. Nowhere do I see in Jesus' teaching that we are to do anything with children like that. And so it stands against everything else I know of Jesus Christ. We are to be like children. And as children, we are to be innocent as doves. All these images that he gives of being childlike and to coming to his feet as children. What a beautiful image Jesus has. Jesus is. That's relevant for today. That's your Jesus. That's my Jesus. Come on over. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll agree with Jay. I don't think John was gay either. I think that's a bit ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, in the book of Re uh, Revelations, it does talk about a lots of violence. People are going to die in Luke 27. <clears throat> now, Jay acknowledges that this will be the heavenly host who does it, so therefore it's okay. But in his second, in his first rebuttal, he said that Allah would send people to hell, and he had a problem with that. But now he's saying that if God decides to exercise his wrath, it's okay. So which one is it? If Allah is bad for sending people to hell, then your God is just as bad for coming back, supposedly Jesus, 
and causing massacres and killing everybody, as the book of Revelation says, and as Luke 27 says. You can't have it both ways and say, oh, when this God does it, it's bad, but when this God exercises His judgment, it's now good. But at least we agree that Jesus loves you until He comes back, and He's going to kill probably half of this side, because they don't believe He's God. <laughs> Okay, we're going to finish there uh, with um, final remarks. So we'll have three minutes now um, for Sammy to sum up, please. All right, so uh, thank you. I'd like to thank Jay as well for joining me. We should do this again. And next time we can maybe debate the jihad verses. I didn't have much time to address them. But nonetheless, let me just address some points which I said I would. For instance, Christians can't be friends with non-Christians in the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. As for Jesus condemning the Pharisees for not killing their children. Matthew 15, verse 3. Now as for women, uh, leadership roles of women in Islam. He said we only mentioned Aisha and Khadija. Exactly. There's too many to mention. There's literally thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of Islamic female scholars listed in the book of Hadith. It would literally take me a day just to mention all their names, especially since they're all in Arabic. But we could do that if you wanted to challenge me. Now, nonetheless, in tonight's debate, I believe most of my points stand. All we heard is that, yeah, these points stand, but Muhammad was all of this. And I believe I tried my best to respond to them. Now, what I say is that I believe both Muhammad and Jesus are relevant to society. I believe both of them brought excellent teachings that can help and reform society. Now, it's true, Jesus didn't have a role in politics and government, but that's only because he was alive for three years, or around for three years. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was around for 13 years preaching in peace before he came into rulership. So you can't really judge it on historical context. Maybe things would have changed one day and Jesus would have rose up and probably become part of government. But nonetheless, that doesn't make the Prophet Muhammad any worse because I study politics and I can tell you politics is very important in society. So for me, both of them are relevant. And let me make a final point. I'm not trying to attack the Bible when I bring it up. All I'm trying to do is to try to be consistent. I'm just trying to show you that I can do the very same thing you do with my book, I can do it with yours, and I can do it even worse. Because there are much worse things in the Bibles that talk about gang rapes, burning females alive, cannibalism, a prophet sending two bears to kill over 60 children. I could go on and have a field day. But I don't judge Christians or Christianity on that. I understand you have your interpretations and explanations. All I ask is for Jay and other Christians to give that same respect, that same consistency to Islam. Why do you do it with your own faith, but not with mine? Why do you accept hell in the Bible, but when it comes to my faith, it's bad? Why do you accept your God coming back, killing everybody, like you have a problem when my God says he will send some people to hell? Only after they know the truth. So we're not even judging anybody who's not a Muslim. So in conclusion, I love Jesus, Muhammad, Moses. Moses is also relevant. I follow all the prophets and they're all relevant. Thank you. Yeah, let me just clear up this last bit that uh, we allow God to come back and we don't allow Allah to come back. If you look, that was in the context of Surah 2, Ayah 256. I was not saying that Allah is not permitted to come back and seek retribution. I was saying it's not consistent to say there is no compulsion in religion when you look at the same verse that talks about quite a bit of compulsion on Allah's part. It's an inconsistency within the verse. That's all we're talking about. Now, what have we done tonight? Tonight, it's been last day, and I'm glad uh, Sammy and I have had this debate. I'm glad we've had this chance to not only knock heads together, I'm glad that we even found a room to do it in that was free. <laughs> it's great to have this kind of freedom, because this is the freedom we're talking about that does exist here in these institutions. This freedom to be critical. But did you notice, I started out this debate with a very important point. I said, I'm going to keep to the New Testament, and I'm going to look at Jesus Christ as my model, and I asked Sammy to keep to the Quran and use Muhammad as his model, which we both agree upon. For, for Sammy, it is the Quran, both the Meccan and the Medinan. For me, it is the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, but I don't go to the Old Testament. I've said that over and over again tonight. 
Because all of that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He doesn't eradicate the law. He talks about the law all the time. You have heard it say, but I now say. Over and over again, Jesus says, you have heard it say, but I now say. Not only fulfilling the law, but then he himself became the whole need for the law. He became the temple. He became, that's basically what the law was all intended to do, to point us to God. Why? Because he was God. And that's why I asked, not Moses and those laws, are they relevant today? No, absolutely not. I don't believe any of those laws are relevant today. That's why we don't follow Mosaic law. Otherwise, we'd have to start sacrificing against out to the goats. Uh, we'd have to help start cir circumcising out to us guys. Uh, we're going to have to start executing rebellious sons. I have three of them. Out to my sons. No, we don't follow Moses for a very good reason. We follow Jesus. And everything we've said tonight, whether it has to do with the family, whether it has to do with compassion, whether it has to do with relevancy of how he treated his enemies, all of that is as relevant the day he was living 2,000 years ago in the first century as it is today in the 21st century. For 30 years I've asked Muslims, find me something wrong with Jesus. And Sami has to admit he loves Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus. Madonna loves Jesus. I don't know of anybody that doesn't love Jesus. Proving his relevancy. That's why so much of tonight has really featured on. We looked at the Quran, we looked at some troubling verses, and those verses we could have gotten a lot more. We didn't, we didn't need to do that tonight. I think those were enough just to show you that much of that in the Quran is not relevant for the 21st century. Maybe for the 7th century, but not for the 21st and not for Britain. But show me anything in the Gospel of Jesus Christ, in the New Testament, that's not relevant for today. I ask any of you, show me. That's Jesus. He is so relevant. That's not just my Jesus. That's your Jesus as well. Guys, thanks so much for coming tonight. I'm sorry if we messed around a bit being here and whatever. But it's good that we managed to do it. Just a couple of thank yous now. Uh, we'd really like to thank the Islamic Society for being able to do this. It was a really enjoyable to work with you, and I'm really glad that we could actually do this thing and inspire having some trouble. Um, and a big thank you to both speakers, Sammy and Jay, for coming up and taking some time out uh, to talk to us today. So thank you so much for this.